Well, that analysis that you did and talked about the community benefits and the dollars that, I mean, it's for a community of 10,000 people, it's, it makes a huge difference. That kind of analysis can be really valuable now to communities here that have a municipal utility because they actually have governance in place that they could make the changes. Maybe not the same scale of your community, maybe a little bit bigger, but I think the regulatory burdens that you're talking about have a lot to do with the incumbent utilities in the U.S. I am so glad you used the word municipal. And I don't know, you're probably, it sounds like you may be five or six steps ahead of me here, but maybe we can sing this song together because I think this is extraordinary. So the history of the electricity grid in every country is roughly similar. The electricity supply used to be a local municipal service. So there'd be a local generator wired up to the local lines and either that was owned by a private company or it was owned by the city. Either way, it was a service to a municipal sort of managed and regulated by the city, if you like. And that aligned the incentives of the LNG system with the local community. Anyway, what happened was all the municipals grew and the communities grew until they actually started to overlap with the next municipal over. And then by agglomeration and et cetera, they became state-based utilities and then they ended up being granted sort of this utility monopoly in many cases, which was a good idea at the time to keep reliability up and costs down, but it doesn't look like a very good idea anymore because especially in the US, the agents who are the most evil in being party to the regulations increasing the cost of rooftop solar and etc., are the utilities. So what we have exposed in our local community is that the natural alignment in the future is between the poles and wires people, the local city and the household. So Australia had the same utility monopoly that largely prevails in America through until about the 1990s. And it actually was a terrible idea of like free market idealism. They said, oh, we have to break this up. It's a monopoly. We're going to need competition. So they divided the grid into four subcomponents. The generator, which is where it's made, the transmission network, which is how electricity gets from where it's generated to your local substation, the distribution network or DNSP, that's the local poles and wires that connect to your house. And then there's a retailer function, which sends you your bill and does the price arbitrage between retail and generators. It was a terrible idea because instead of having one organization and one organization's worth of overhead to get your electricity, we now had four. So the price of everyone's electricity went up and up and up and up. What also enabled is we, we didn't have this competition between a utility and the rooftop solar. So that was, that was you know tangentially associated with the fact that our rooftop solar prices went down. But what's really extraordinary now is that for the vision I just told you to come true, you only need one of these four. You need the, the DNSP. And so these four can stop acting as a cabal here. And the DNSP is really your local Mooney. And it looks like, um, because what we've been trying to do is make our community, they call it postcode in Australia, but our zip code equivalent is 2515. But we've got agreement from our DNSP to actually operate like an old fashioned Mooney and build an alliance with the households in the city. We've also got buy-in from our city because they're excited to be the first zero emission city in the world. So we've got local volunteers under the banner Electrify 2515. We've even got a gang sign. It's like 2515. <laughs> and the community is all excited about it because we're concerned, you know, we all swim together in the local ocean and talk about how hot it is and we need a solution. But now there is a solution. And it's in economically in favor for the households, the city's playing along, the distribution lines are playing along. And what we've done, and Bruce, it sounds like you have read the book. So we sort of got to the point where we have a shot on creating the rules that you might call grid neutrality. So in our local community, the electricity that I purchase from the other side of the substation, I'll still pay the 27 or 28 cents for. My rooftop solar, I'll pay four cents for. But if I'm buying my neighbor's rooftop solar or if they're using my battery to shift their load, there won't be transaction costs on that local thing. So I'll pay my neighbor five or 10 cents. Distributor will take a small fee on top of that for the services maintaining the wires. But it looks like there'll be three sort of rates. There'll be this average 28 cent rate, the average four cent rate for your rooftop solar and the community generated stuff will come in at about 12 cents in the middle. And I just think this is extraordinary. 
right? You'll get an even further discount on that future energy price. And I think it's actually by demonstrating this and showing this and telling this story about a natural alliance in this new renewable all electric world is the household and the city. It's super exciting to me. Sorry, that was a long monologue, Jeannie. I hope it covered what you're interested in there. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Does your local distribution circuit ever sell on a net basis out to the rest of the grid? 40% of distribution substations in my state ran flow backwards last month. So this is the extraordinary thing happens with high penetration rooftop solar. So we actually do at times in our suburb produce enough electricity amongst ourselves to be a net exporter to the larger grid. Lots of things happen because of that. One of the things is that then the larger old fossil plants on the grid can then retire. Uh, the Australian government hasn't quite had that realization yet, but we're getting them there. You're going to run at lower and lower capacity factors, I would, I would imagine. Yeah, you know, the capacity factor of most coal plants now is under 60% because no one's really maintaining them and doing any upkeep. So they're falling apart themselves. We had a quote unquote energy crisis a few months back and it was just because four of the big coal plants went down at the same time because no one's spending money to maintain them. You said they're running less than 60%? Mm -hmm. Yes, not joking. Like the unreliable assets on the modern grid are coal and gas. So absolutely, this does lead to retirement of fossil. We also need a profound build out of renewables in Australia, just as you do in the US. We need to, if everyone electrifies all the things, about 280% of the electricity we currently produce needs to be delivered. So not only do we have to offset the retirement of the existing set of coal plants, but we need to make three times as much. Australia no longer talks about 100% renewables. We talk about 700%. That's an extraordinary thing. So we, like the US, are a net exporter of energy. Today, we export a lot of coal and a lot of liquid natural gas, LNG. So there's a high concern. So what happens to our fossil fuel industries? You know, there's lots of consternation about among very serious men in gray suits who honestly haven't done the math to realize that actually 90% of LNG exports is foreign owned in Australia. So like they argue that it's good for jobs and good for the nation, but all of the money and all the profits leave. But the idea of 700% renewables is we make so much renewable electricity that we process our iron ore domestically into steel, our bauxite domestically into aluminium. We are talking about building cables from giant solar arrays in the Australian desert to Singapore and to Southeast Asia. We talk about hydrogen exports. I temper my enthusiasm for hydrogen. I think that's a little over hyped, but it's a pretty extraordinary shift from we can, you know, if we try really, really hard, we'll get to 100% renewables to like, hey, this shit's so cheap. Let's build 700%. Great idea. In the intro to your book, you said something like, uh, to the fossil fuel industry, thank you for your hundred years of service. Kind of move on now. And what about what about the same kind of message to the to these utilities? I mean, there has to be a shakeup, right? They're so resistant. They're doing so much to stand in the way of change. We need. They need to be part of the solution. Yeah. Anytime you can make a ally instead of an enemy, I think is good. And you'd love the utilities to wake up. And yeah, they have done an incredible job, and they have kept your grandmother warm for a hundred years. Um, and thank you. But it's not clear that you couldn't achieve what we need to achieve with the utility system, but they'd have to have that realization that the, just the distribution component has had here, that there's going to be more electricity. That's good for everyone. It's good for climate. It's good for us. I think it might come in California through the CCAs. You might get a rogue muni somewhere in the Midwest or a rogue co-op to set the dials on their rules. And I think it's down to like, I'd find those chinks in the armor make it happen somewhere. And as soon as it's like, there's this one town where, oh my Lord, look at them. They're driving around for one cent a mile. That's gonna change everyone's mind. It's actually partly why I'm enjoying being in Australia. I think we can build that community here first, just for some historical accident reasons. And I think once we've done it and you advertise it to the world, the Americans aren't gonna to tolerate not having that something that that's, that's that good. That's right. Does Australia need a rewiring Australia? Oh, wait a second. You can see it there on the wall rewiring Australia. Um, Australia does have a rewiring Australia now, and New Zealand has a rewiring New Zealand, which is called rewiring Aotearoa. Um, and in fact, we are looking at rewiring the world. 
the extraordinary thing about rewiring America and rewiring Australia as a environmentalist movement is it's really the first environmentalist movement that is YIMBY instead of NIMBY. If you think about our 50 year history of environmentalist movements, they're nearly all about tearing things down and stopping things. Tie yourself to a fence, stop the pipeline, stop the this, the that, the other. I think the world needs an environmentalist movement that's all about pragmatic action and solutions, and that's about building things and getting things done. It's about transforming communities, and I think we're doing a pretty good job at rewiring America. And you know, at the risk of expanding our mandate and being too complicated, I think we need to go global. And this, you know, I think this is the storyline of transformation that is optimistic and about improving every household's life. So. With some urgency, I'm lobbying my colleagues at Rewiring America. Like, no, not big enough, guys. <laughs> let's, let's let's really let's do this like we mean it. Let's rewire the world. Awesome, that's great. When can we read the Big Switch? Uh, you can read the Big Switch right away. Big Switch is a fun read, and then the community, the quarterly essay. It's called The Wires That Bind. So really, I think that's an even more important book. That's about the community stories. It's about community okay. leadership. It's about actually what can communities do we changed the politics in australia with this community project the story is pretty interesting a local group of parents came to me they're all sort of mid-30s they've got adorable little four to eight-year-old children they had been extinction rebellion in australia and they came to me and said we're you know it's a little bit hard to do these protests for extinction rebellion with the children and it doesn't feel like we're making any progress is there something we can do that's more productive and i said why don't you see if we can rewire our own community and so they started electrified 2515 it was all volunteerism they literally did posters and t-shirts and bumper stickers so every car every house every business in the area has this bumper sticker uh, or poster on it we've got nearly 2,000 households out of the 4,000 have signed on to be part of a electrified pilot we're now getting state and federal funding to actually be the world's first and we're working closely with the distribution power network. And because of all that, it's the first time there's been a grassroots climate solution and they're loud about it. We make the national news media almost daily now with the story of this community transformation, like I did with Rewire America. You know, I'm involved talking directly to the federal government here. When I go to Canberra to talk to the federal government, there are politicians there who say to me, thank you. You have changed the conversation permanently because you have shown us that the community is ready for very rapid, very transformative climate action. And so I think this is a bit of a first in climate where we've now got community pull. There's nothing that moves politicians like community pull because that's voters and we're transforming the face of politics here. So it's no longer partisan in the same way as is in the US. And it's about how you do it. It's not if we do it. So I don't know, it's amazing. It is, it's a really exciting place to be. I can't actually go anywhere in town without people asking me, you know, so tell me which, which heat pump and when, when are we gonna have something like IRA legislation here? And saw you on TV last week, congratulations and high five. Like it's the, the talk of the town is that we are going to do it. We're gonna succeed on climate. Seems like there's a lot of peer pressure too and at that level where, you know, being like the last roof that has not put PV on it. It's got, you know, you got all your neighbors looking at you, right? <laughs> this community is originally a coal mining community. So you've got to like, I live in the West Virginia of Australia. My local surf break is called Coal Cliff, C-O-A-L. You can see the black bands of coal in the cliff that goes all the way to the water's edge, right? We, we, we live on coal. The nickname for our part of Australia is the coal coast. So you can imagine the transformation where we now have, you know, all of the children of coal miners and a few of the cranky old coal miners themselves wanting to do this. And they see that it's the right thing to do. They see that this is where the jobs of the future come. They see the economic renewal story. I think it's an even better story because we come from those origins and you can see the transformation. All of this community transformation makes me really excited about getting Stacey Abrams to join Rewiring America because I think there's few community organizers that are better in the US than her. And so I'm excited to see how we can translate this Australian experience of Electrified 2515 
of Rewiring Australia, to rewiring American communities with her skills in community engagement and movement building. We now need a movement. I think that movement needs to be grassroots. It needs to be about the positive changes in your community. And so I'm really excited for that. Wow. She's amazing. Congratulations on that. And these are really great stories and, and, uh, and powerful. Thanks for being on the show, Saul. All right. Thank you, guys. Sorry I didn't have more time. I, As you can see, I enjoy talking about the community piece of this a lot. Well, I'm looking forward to reading about it, and uh, we'll have more questions, I'm sure. Okay. Terrific. See you all. Take care. Thanks. See you.